All right, welcome back to another installment of the Wide Ride Podcast. I'm Andy Navarro, Miami Hurricanes beat writer for The Athletic. Joined today by a familiar face, guy you've seen on the broadcast team quite a bit over on the ACC network with ESPN. That would be Roddy Jones, former running back at uh, Georgia Tech. Roddy was uh, at Florida State uh, last weekend uh, to, to call the Seminoles 47-7 to win over Duquesne. I wanted to get Roddy on to come talk about the Hurricanes, but really to give us a good idea about the ACC this year, because this man does his homework uh, like nobody else. Uh, how you doing, man, first of all? I am fantastic. I'm uh, I'm excited to be talking about football. You and I were just talking before, like there's only so many times you can explain who you picked in the Coastal and why. Um, so it's good to have something on the field that we can at least talk about, man. But uh, I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. I, I like like you. I'm I'm ready to see this thing get rolling. Uh, Mario Cristobal, you know, he, he's not given us many you know morsels to chew on from from practice, but he did go to the Nick Saban School of Secrecy. Yeah. So, uh, you got to understand, he got his master's degree there, right? And and there's yep. much uh, we're going to hear about the Kings. But uh, look, I, I I think they're going to be better. I think they're going to be uh, certainly with all the money they spent on coaching, they have to be better coach. Right. So uh, right. that, we'll, we'll get to the Canes. We're actually going to wrap up with the Canes because I want to start uh, taking a look at the ACC. And, and of course, you just came from Florida State. What did you see in that game? What are, what are your biggest takeaways about the Seminoles? Uh, Manny, I think first and foremost, you saw a program growing up. Um, this was a team that has LSU this upcoming week. This, the, the game that everybody's been talking about all off season. So it'd be really easy for them to just say, Hey, look, we're going to roll over Duquesne and we're going to get on um, to LSU kind of like they did last year after performing well against Notre Dame, even though it was a loss, then they lose to Jacksonville state because they just go out and they don't play hard. They don't play well. They miss too many assignments. So I, I think you see a program growing up from a maturity standpoint. Um, they were able to run the football better than I thought they would. And I thought this was going to be one of the best rushing teams in the conference. Now I think they're threesome with uh, Treshawn Ward, Trey Benson, and uh, Lawrence Toafili. That's as good as there is in the league. And I'm including those three guys at Clemson. Those guys were fantastic on Saturday. And while they may not be the athletes that like the Miami guys are, the Clemson guys are, they all run hard, they all break tackles, and they've all got enough speed to hurt you downfield. Um, and then defensively, I think you saw, a, a, again, a mature group. Uh, you saw a group of guys that didn't look like um, they, they didn't look like they were playing their position for a first time, which is what it looked like a lot last year. because They were moving guys around, didn't quite have the linebackers figured out, didn't quite have the secondary figured out. And when they figured all that out, they matured and they got better, which is why they won five of their last eight. Um, now, I do still think there's some holes on that team. But I think overall, this is a much better Florida State team and, and a team that if they continue to improve, Jordan Travis wasn't asked to do much. The receivers weren't asked to do much. If those guys can come through, then I think this could be a team that um, that ends up being pretty good. Certainly a bowl team, maybe more. They were the only team uh, to beat Miami over the second half of last season when when Tyler Van Dyke really figured things out. And people always are, are, are quick to dismiss the Seminoles these days because, well, they, you know, they went five and seven. Right. I mean, how, how good can they honestly be right. from one year to the next? But, um, you know, I got to give Mike Norville credit. He keeps getting good players out of the transfer portal. He's yep. restocked the shelves quickly. And that's what you got to do if you're going to turn things around quickly. Yeah, he's been as good as anybody this side of Nick Saban in the transfer portal. And Miami's had its hits. Uh, obviously Alabama has been fantastic. Michigan state had a great year last year, but Mike Norvell's done it consistently. He got Jermaine Johnson last year from Georgia, Keir Thomas as well. Jamie Robinson and all ACC safety this year. He gets Trey Benson, who I think's got immense potential at the running back spot. They got Jared verse the transfer from Albany who had a sack in the game and was this close, really close to having probably three more. Uh, they got Tatum Bethune, a guy at UCF who, uh, who had a, an excellent season, for the Knights last year, played well against Florida. So he has done as well as anybody in the transfer portal. And then he filled out some other pieces. And, and I think he's doing it the right way. He's getting transfer portal guys that will improve the culture, which is so, has been sorely needed. Jermaine Johnson has done wonders for that program, both as a player, as a person, as a preparer, uh, and, and then as a recruiter. Because Jared Verse talked to J Jermaine Johnson when he was thinking about coming. And Jermaine Johnson was like, look, here's what I like. Here's what I don't like. Here's what we did. Here's how I think they'll use you. Here's how they use me. Laid it out on the table. And Jared Verse went there in large part because of that, that transparency. So, yeah, he has done an excellent job in the transfer portal. 
Is uh, Verse as good as Jermaine Johnson, or what, what's your sort of no. early impressions? I mean, that, that dude was a beast last year, man. He is, he is not Jermaine Johnson, and he's not going to be. Uh, but Jermaine Johnson was an older, more mature player when he came over than, than Jared Verse is. Um, and Jermaine Johnson played against Georgia players every single week in practice, which Jared Verse, you know, obviously played at U of Albany. So uh, I, I, Jermaine John, excuse me, Jared Verse, I think has the opportunity, has the ability to be one of the better pass rushers in this league. How he plays against the run, which was a very underrated part of Jermaine Johnson's game, is still a question. He's only 245 ish, um, which is heavy enough, but it, like Jermaine Johnson was like 260, you know, 265 and 6'5 long, mature. Um, so he's not there yet, but he showed some burst off the edge. North Carolina was the other team that played in week zero. And, you know, they kind of had a little bit of a struggle there in the first half against the FAMU yeah. team. It was like missing, what, 26 guys? Yeah. Uh, I was a little surprised to see 21-14 when I tuned in in the second quarter. They eventually pulled away. Drake May uh, looked very good, I thought, at quarterback. Um, and, it, and it seems like Mac Brown, you know, when he talks about uh, his team, he talks about the improvement in the offensive line and how that's going to really be a, a big difference for them. They end up scoring 56 points against FAMU. I know FAMU has some players on defense that aren't bad. Um, what were your impressions of May, and, and what do you think of North Carolina's ceiling for the season? I thought Drake May was fantastic. And this is, you know, big praise to heap on a guy that's played one game. But physically, he's more talented than Sam Howell. Mm -hmm. And it kind of reminds me of the Taj Boyd to Deshaun Watson transition at Clemson. Like, Taj Boyd left, and it was like, man, how are they ever going to find a quarterback that good? And that's kind of what we did with Sam Howell, what we've done. And you don't quite realize how well they've recruited behind. And so the next then and physically, Deshaun Watson was an upgrade on, on Taj Boyd. Physically, Drake May is an upgrade on Sam Howell. He's bigger. He's faster in, in, in terms of straight line speed. He looked just as elusive. I mean, some of the throws that he made were absolutely effortless. Off platform, you know, all the highlight throws that we, st we love now because of Mahomes and Josh Allen. The throw to Josh Downs up the seam was exactly that. He's fading backwards uh, and throws it off platform. And it's a laser where only Josh Downs can get it. So I'm not saying he's going to be Deshaun Watson. I'm not saying he's going to be better than Sam Howell. But physically, it's the same sort of trend that you saw at Clemson going from Taj Boyd to Deshaun Watson. It's similar going from Sam Howell, a great quarterback in his own right, one of the best in the history of that program. But Drake May is an upgrade physically. So if he can continue to develop, he's going to make some mistakes. But if he can continue to develop, man, watch out, because I think they have a chance to be really good. Defensively, I actually – I mean, FAMU obviously moved the football. I think the big thing for FAMU is they possess the football. And I think those uh, – the the UNC defense, I thought, played tight in the secondary. It was a lot of loose coverage. Um, and, you know, they, they didn't make plays with the ball in the air. I thought they were really simple in their uh, – in their, in their coverages – um, and they got the ball out quick. So like a lot of the questions that I've seen asked over the past couple of days, have been, why didn't UNC get more pressure? And my answer would be, fam, you got the ball out. If they get the ball out in two and a half seconds. You're not getting to the quarterback. Noah Taylor actually created a decent amount of pressure, especially in the first half. He had a sack. Um, and, and Ray Vahasek was in the backfield. Miles Mur Murphy was in the backfield. But I think those guys, uh, number one, they were getting the ball out quick. And number two, I thought they were a little eager. So they were like tight in the secondary, eager on the defensive line. So they're driving guys back, but it, like, it's, it's in the wrong gap. They're sort of out of position. So can Gene Chizik get that fixed? I don't know, man, to be honest with you. They got App State this week. Um, but physically, I still feel pretty decent about where that uh, UNC defense is. Miami gets UNC before it gets Florida State. But you know what we like to do as fans, right, before the season starts? We, we do the WL thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Schedule. And so every Miami fan just automatically says, oh, they've got to beat both of these teams because they got them at home. they got Florida State at home. They've got North Carolina at home. North Carolina, I think Florida State comes in November. North Carolina, as I said, the first ACC game. I'm asking you, which one is going to be the tougher opponent for Miami? That's a really good question. Um, I think Miami is going to be able to put up points. So uh, that Carolina game to me could be a shootout, but I would edge. I would, I would lean towards Miami. I'm going to say Florida state because I think that Florida state defense will be really good. I mean, they played without Amari on Cooper, one of their starting safe uh, starting corners, uh, which forced them into kind of a rotation, um, but they still played pretty well. I think that defensive line is going to continue to mature and build depth. The linebackers are still figuring each other out. But with Kalen Deloach and Tatum Bethune, I think they're good. So I, I'm going to say Florida State. 
um, because from what I've seen, Mike Norvell, a more uh, creative play caller, he puts you in more conflict, gives you more to think about. He's going to utilize all the weapons, how they're supposed to be used. I like the pieces. Um, whereas North Carolina may be more physically talented at the top on offense, Drake May, Josh Downs, the two freshman running backs that I think are really good. Uh, I think it's easy. It plays more to Miami's strengths. It's going to be easier for them to know what's coming. Now they got to execute, and that's what North Carolina is going to make you do because they're really good players. But I'll say Florida State. All right. Uh, not that the blue chip ratio tells the story in the ACC every year because it, it's quite the opposite. But yeah. Miami is the second most talented team on paper when it comes to blue chip ratio in the conference behind Clemson. Then it's North Carolina. Then it's Florida State. Um, so uh, to me, you know, it doesn't matter what you know, kind of happens in the offseason. You always have to respect Florida State and North Carolina's talent. And if those guys get coached up, you can't just sit there and write a W if you're Miami. Yeah. The other thing is, like, with that talent, this is the thing about the league, the the talent gap isn't that big between, let's say, 2 and 10. Uh, and, and it's certainly not as big as, as, as it once was. Um, so if you don't play well and somebody gets hot, and you catch, especially with the quarterbacks that you've got, like, Miami obviously goes up to Virginia this year. Virginia has no offensive linemen. Like they, they all five offensive linemen are gone. They've got massive questions, but Brendan Armstrong is one of the best quarterbacks in the league and he's got weapons. So if you decide you don't want to play that day, you're going to get lit up on the scoreboard. That's just the kind of league it is this year. And, and while we like to look at blue chip ratio, and I think it is, it's very uh, telling COVID kind of through the, because you look at a team like uh, Pitt, you look at a team like NC State, you look at a team like Wake Forest, they are really old teams, yeah. especially on the offensive and defensive lines. So while the talent lay, lies with you know UNC, Miami, Florida State, Clemson, the experience lies with those other teams. And, and I think you just get less of the up and down when you have that experience. I'm glad you brought up Wake because obviously, you know, the deal with Sam Hartman changes things for them. But you know that roster. You, I mean, they, they won last year. They got to the ACC title game. Um, how much respect do we still have to give Wake Forest if Sam Hartman doesn't come back here? Uh, a ton. I, I think the, the, the offense is set up to have success no matter who plays quarterback. And that's not diminishing what Sam Hartman is. He's a really good player. But it's miss, if Mitch Griffiths goes out and he's not quite as dynamic as Sam, Hart, as, uh, as Sam Hart, Hartman and – but turns the ball over less then I think they could be just as effective on offense. Cause Sam Hartman did lead the league in interceptions last year. I think we, we kind of forget that or was, or was near the top if he wasn't at the top. Uh, so I, I think Mitch, the ability to do, it. I just talked about how experienced they were. They've got two, uh, they've got a seventh year senior, two sixth year seniors, a fifth year, uh, a, a fifth year senior. And then a, like a fourth year junior on the offensive line. I like think they're, they're incredibly old on that offensive line. Um, and then at receiver, A.T. Perry's back, Taylor Morin's back, and he slides into the slot to replace your Quarry Roberson. And they get Donovan Green back, a guy that we were all really excited about a couple of years ago towards ACL before last year. They've got a guy, Keyshawn Helton, who's explosive out of the slot. That offense, I think, will be fine. The real question's for me, how good is Wake going to be defensively? Because without Sam Hartman, they are going to have to improve defensively. They're not just going to be able to score 50 on everybody. They may have to – they may score 40. But then you need a couple stops so that the other team doesn't score 50. So I think you have to give Wake a lot of respect. Um, I picked him to finish second in the Atlantic. This was before that we knew about the Sam Hartman um, ailment. Uh, but I do think they still have an opportunity to finish there, especially um, especially because I that offense is just so unique and it's set up for success around the quarterback position. We saw what uh, pre, uh, big time preseason uh, expectations did to North Carolina last year. They came out, lost the first game. NC State this year is kind of that. Okay, they came out of nowhere, right? Like everybody's like, "Why is NC State in the top 15 or whatever?" <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on the Wolfpack? I know Miami beat them last year, and and it was one of those thrilling performances. Tyler Van Dyke showed up, but um, a lot of people think they're going to win the conference this year. Where do you sit on them? Uh, and, and Tyler Van Dyke talked smack and showed up. Yeah. That was that was his coming out party. I loved it. <laughs> um, in terms of NC State, I, I think they are – so they're not Carolina from last year. Carolina last year, the roster for Carolina in 2020 was not as good as their record. They had excellent players. Javante Williams, Michael Carter, De'Ami Brown, Daz Newsom, obviously Sam Howell. And defensively, they did enough. Uh, but they were not a nine-win roster in 2020. They also weren't a six-win roster 
in 2021, but they had the complacency set in and they, and they sort of had this attitude of, of, you know, we, we are, in, we're entitled to this almost. Um, it's like that in terms of a program, they don't get that sense of entitlement. They still have that chip on their shoulder. At least it seems like it. And they're a more experienced roster. So I, I think NC state will be about what they were last year. If they're able to get better on offense, then maybe they can challenge Clemson. But remember, that was a terrible Clemson offense last year, and it was still a double overtime game for NC State in one of the sloppier first halves in the ACC. Like, it was, the first half was unwatchable almost. But down the stretch, they, they ended up beating Clemson, but they go to Clemson this year, and Clemson hasn't lost at home since 2016. So uh, I don't think they're quite there. I've got questions about them on offense. They lost their top two rushers. They lose their leading receiver and a first-round tackle just hard for me to see them being better losing all those pieces maybe Devin Leary does that maybe they open up the offense change things a little bit and, and they are able to be better um but it was the upper half of the middle class offense last year where I expect them to be this year uh and then defensively I think they'll be very good but are they going to be better than Clemson I don't I don't think so they're going to be better than Pitt I don't know I really like Pitt's defense and I think the uniqueness of their defense plays into their hands so I like NC State um they're probably a top 20 maybe top 15 team to me i don't quite see him as a top 10 yet at least not until those questions are answered all right uh who did you end up picking to win was it clemson uh clemson. versus pitt? i was so boring it was clemson pitt clemson winning it you know sometimes i go out on a limb and i think i, I did go out on a limb last year i picked miami um but i'm boring this year i'm just going chalk <laughs> well i picked miami to get there and and, and you know I, I guess i have to because if not i get disowned by mario right away i've got to that's true show the confidence right yep. um I, I think Pitt is a very, very good team. Um, and I know people are saying, well, Kadon Slovis, look what he did this last year at USC. He struggled. You know, there's no guarantee he's going to come in and be Kenny Pickett. What do you see as, I guess, the biggest obstacle for Pitt to get back to the title game? I think weapons on the perimeter on offense. That's really the only question that I have. And, and I, I get the criticism of Keaton Slovis last year in, in his performances. But let's take the full context of it. He had a coach that was fired after three games. He had just, I mean, in the offseason, he'd lost his best receiver. Amon Ross St. Brown goes to the Packers and is, has done a great job there. Uh, or excuse me, the Lions, and has done a great job there. Um, he gets hurt, and so he's playing the majority of the season a little banged up. And I still believe he led the Pac-12 in yards per game. Now it was like 230 yards per game. But he was still one of the top three in the league. This is the guy that threw for 3,500 yards his freshman year at USC. This is a guy who was the first team all Pac-12 quarterback in 2020 in the shortened season. And then when the house burns down around him, we criticize him for not having his stuff together. It's like, <laughs> no, he's just trying to survive um, with, with everything crumbling around him. So, so I, don't, I don't really take a lot of stock in, in what happened in 2021. He's in a really stable position at Pitt. He is a guy who I think is uh, innately accurate, which is what they need. Um, Gavin Bartholomew is going to be excellent at tight end. I do have questions at receiver. Jared Wayne's back, and he's highly reliable. But they need that explosive receiver. And I think Kanata Mumfield may be able to do that, the transfer from Akron. Akron, thank you. I knew it was one of the A's. Yeah, I kept it's saying Western Albany. Michigan every time I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Pitt, that would have been good for Pitt fans to hear. Western Michigan transfer. Um, but, but maybe he can be that. I think that running back room is going to be excellent. They've got all five starters back in the offensive line. And then defensively, it should be one of the best defensive lines on the conference. They're experienced a linebacker with Servasia Dennis, who's just a playmaker. Shane Simon played a lot at Notre Dame. He comes over. Those two safeties are really explosive or really experienced and can be explosive, especially, especially Eric Hallett, BJ Hills, with a nice downhill piece. And then the two corners have played a lot. So I, there's a lot to like about Pitt. The one question is at receiver. And if Jordan Addison's back, they probably don't have that question. He's not. Um, but I still think they are probably the most sure thing in the Coastal right now. I think everybody recognizes quarterback. It remains the biggest question for for Clemson, right? Is DJ yeah. Mongolale going to get it together? They're going to have to go to the freshman, Cade Klubnik. I think people automatically assume, or maybe Tigers fans do, that, well, he's going to be Trevor Lawrence, right? It's just it's going to be a similar <laughs> story. He can just come in and, and deliver the same way. I, look, Clemson's defense is going to be ridiculous. We know that. I mean, it, it's just – it feels like they've, they've probably got – 11 NFL guys in their starting lineup and, and maybe another five or six behind them. Um, what, what is your take on what's going to happen at Clemson this year? Cause Miami does travel 
to Clemson yeah. in the next to last game of the season before they play Pitt. And those last two games are going to be huge for the Hurricanes. But what's your take on Clemson? Don't forget about that trip to Atlanta the week before that, man. I mean, oh, that's going to be – that's good. I mean, look, I mean, that's a murderer, to walk over murderer's row yeah, right there. <laughs> <laughs> I just hope the Yellow Jackets are still together at that point. Um, uh, Cle- Clemson, uh, so defensively, uh, Dabo Sweeney keeps saying there's seven guys on the defensive line that are going to play in the NFL. Maybe that's true. I know there's four of them. Uh, I, actually, I know there's five of them that are on there. I mean, Brian Bazin, Miles Murphy are the two headliners potential first round picks and I hate throwing that out because anything can happen and they may slide to the second round and that's not a that that's not a, a, a knock on them like that's not something that lo- would look poorly on them but but they level of potential Xavier Thomas KJ Henry Justin Maskell all guys that could play at the next level you look at the inside Tyler Davis Rook Ororo guys that have enough talent to play at the next level so when you have when you start there it's tough. And we saw what a dominant defensive line can do last year at Georgia. So it's going to be tough for anybody to, to, to be able to control that. The linebackers, and yes, they're inexperienced. They're sliding Trenton Simpson inside to Will Linebacker. He's one of the most explosive players in this league. Pair him up with uh, Jeremiah Trotter Jr. and Barrett Carter. And it's one of the most athletic linebacking cores Clemson's had since Dabo's been there. And then in the secondary, Andrew Makuba was the defensive rookie of the year last year. They've got experience at corners. So it's, it's going to be a hell of a defense. And Wes is over at defensive coordinator, and I think he'll be fine. And this is not uh, knocking his ability, but I think you or I could call that defense and make it, like, pretty decent. You know, we, it's, it's generally it, the floor is so high for that defense that, that I think anybody could do it. But I do think he has the potential to make it great. The questions are offensively, and the more I've thought about it, I think we'll we have the potential to see two different Clemson offenses this year. If it's DJ Uyunglele, I think it is a run based offense. It's Will Shipley, Phil Moffa, uh, Mikey Dukes, all day long, um, with uh, some quarterback run mixed in, and then you're asking DJ to take shots downfield. So the short pass game is essentially taken out, supplemented by the run game. Add quarterback, get some extra numbers. And that's sort of your short pass game, maybe screens, you know, that's going to be the extent of the short pass game. Then you're going to push it down the field, sort of a mixture between, you know, what UNC does running the football and then the Baylor offense where it's like screens and then deep shots. And then when you club Nick in, if we see him, then it's more traditional run game, short pass game, you know, sort of dink and dunk down the field, maybe take a shot every now and again. But that's sort of how I would mold those two offenses. So take out what DJ doesn't do well short passes, intermediate passes, accuracy, let him do what he does do well, take shots, throw the ball down the field. And he's actually pretty decent when you look at him uh, throwing the ball. And then you play off the run game. And and then if Cade Klubnick's in, you move the pocket, you're going short passes. He's the more accurate and moving it that way. And then when you get in the red zone, you're pounding the ball, maybe doing some zone read stuff out on the perimeter with him. So he's not taking those shots up the middle. Uh, so so uh, that's what I think they'll do. We'll see, man. Like, if if they try and do what they did last year with DJ, I just don't see it working. I think that offense gets bogged down just like it did just like it did last year. Um, and he's just not an accurate passer right now. He hasn't shown it the last two seasons, didn't show it in the spring. Um, so it's hard to think that he'll all of a sudden become that. Uh, and then they've got some questions at receiver on the perimeter. Uh, with who's going to step up. So the strength of that team is the offensive line, the running backs, and I expect them to play to that. Yeah, it should be a fun uh, fun final two weeks of the regular season for Miami. You really get a good idea. Um, I know you got to get going here soon. Um, four coaches on coachinghotseat.com from the ACC. Uh, your Yellow Jackets, of course, Jeff Collins. He's uh, number three on the list. Dino Babers from Syracuse is sixth. Norvell from Florida State, 21st, and Satterfield from Louisville, 26th. I'm going to ask you this. Who will not be there at the end of the 2022 season? On the hot seat or at their current school? Either or. <laughs> uh, I'll give you two. So so uh, Mike Norvell comes off the hot seat. I think a lot of Florida State this year. And if he's able to win seven, eight games with that schedule, uh, which I think they're more than capable of, then yes, I, I think he's removed from the hot seat. Because this is a team that plays uh, four of the five ranked preseason teams in the ACC. They play Florida. They play LSU. They play Louisiana. So you've got the Sun Belt champions. You've got two schools that just produce talent, uh, like it's nobody's biz- business out of the SEC, especially LSU. Then you've got four ranked teams in conference. If you can win seven or eight games with that schedule, Mike Norvell uh, will certainly be off the hot seat. And then I think there are seven win teams, so I think he comes off the hot seat. Um, 
Dino Babers is an interesting one because I don't know if this is a bowl team. It's a tough schedule. They get Purdue and Notre Dame in the non-conference. That's tough. Um, so I, but his buyout uh, reportedly is $10 million. And I don't know if Syracuse can stomach that Scott Satterfield. I I'm, you know, I think that's a good offense. I think it's a really good offense. I have questions about them defensively. I think they end up making a bowl. I just don't know what they'll tolerate at Louisville. I don't have a good feel on that. Um, I do, however, know very well what's going on at Georgia tech. And so I think the, if you're going to pick a coach, that's not going to be there next year. It's probably Jeff Collins. Um, it's a team that that is is trying to sell a lot, and if you're selling, it means that you don't really have the production uh, returning. Jameer Gibbs leaves and goes to Alabama. Jordan Mason, who had a great game against Miami last year, uh, leaves and goes to the NFL. Um, when you look at them on defense, their two best defensive ends transfer and go to Ole Miss and Arkansas. And so you've got a lot of new faces, not to mention seven new assistant coaches, a new offensive coordinator, changes on the defense, um, and the least amount of returning production in the ACC, not to mention Jeff Sims, who's been as up and down as any quarterback in the league. Uh, add on top of that, their first five weeks of the season, you get Clemson at a neutral site here in Atlanta. You get Western Carolina, then Ole Miss at home, at UCF, at Pitt. It's a brutal start to the season. They get Georgia at the end of the year. Um, so I just think it'll be tough for them to win even five. And, and I think if you're a two, three or four win team, um, then Jeff Collins, people are certainly going to be calling for not only Jeff Collins, there's some discontent with the athletic director too. Uh, so I, I don't know, man, I, I think Jeff Collins is probably the surest bet to have uh, have an uphill battle when it comes to keeping his job. And we can get to Miami with this one, uh, define a successful season for the four new head coaches in the league. And this will, this will keep us through all 14 squads, yeah. hit all of them. Duke, Miami, Virginia Tech, and uh, Virginia. So, so for Duke, it's improvement. They got to win it. I think winning a couple of conference games is improvement. Um, and, and there's some talent on that roster. Zero and eight last year in conference, and there's no reason for that. So you've got to win the Tech game. You got to see if you can knock off a Boston College. You got to see if you can knock off maybe Virginia Tech when they come to your place. Uh, but if if Mike Elko can do that, take care of business in the non-conference, then they'll be flirting with a bowl game. Although at Northwestern, at Kansas, not quite as easy looking as it was uh, about a week ago. So I think winning an ACC game, getting to that four or five win mark is success there. For Tony Elliott and Virginia, I think make a bowl game and Virginia Tech. I think it's make a bowl game for both of those. Show improvement in the areas where you were sufficient, where, where you were terrible last year. So for Virginia Tech, you got to be better on offense. For Virginia, you got to be better on defense while showing momentum on the sides that that your head coach is known for. I have questions about how Virginia's offense is going to mesh in that offensive line. So they've got to show that they're at least decent. And then Virginia Tech, they've got some pieces on defense, but they just have to play better. Um, so, so can Brent Pry and Chris Marv do that? And for Miami, I, I mean, look – if they're not going into the last two weeks of the year fighting for the ACC championship game, it's not a successful year. They have to be fighting for the ACC championship game at Clemson and at Pitt at the end of the year in order, or I think they get Pitt at home. Yeah, they do. Uh, but, but they have to be fighting for the ACC championship game at the end. Like they should be in either the catbird seat or, or it should be right there going into those last two and having to go to Clemson decreases the margin for error for them. But I don't think Pitt makes it through undefeated. So if you're able to get to Clemson undefeated in conference play, even if you lose in Death Valley, which everybody since 2016 has, you still ha are in, in position to win the Coastal Division, uh, getting Pitt at home going into the last week of the year. So if they are not doing that, then I, I don't think it's a successful year. Because if, if you're knocked out before you get to November 19th, then you've underachieved in some way, shape, or form, or the league is just drastically better than we thought they were. But um, knocking off Texas a would be great, wonderful for Miami, but I think it's going to come down to what happens in conference play, uh, given that they take care of Southern Miss, Middle Tennessee, Bethune-Cookman, and then get to, uh, get to Clemson undefeated in conference play. Yeah, I think most people are thinking nine or ten wins if Mario is really going to take a step forward um, with this with this team and getting him to the ACC championship game would would probably send the message he needs to get those recruits. Yeah. You've got a great recruiting class right now. The question is, come December, are those guys going to stick with Miami or look to jump ship? And getting the ACC title game probably does that for him. 
Yeah, I, I agree. And look, I don't even I don't even know if they have to get to the ACC title game. I think it certainly puts a marker down. It, it absolutely does. Um, but I mean, you, you said nine or ten wins. I don't think there's any shame in going to Clemson as a one loss team. That one loss being at Texas A and M, losing to Clemson, and then maybe even losing to Pitt and not going to the ACC champ ACC championship game. It'll feel a lot like 2017 did. But those teams are better than the teams that that. Miami lost to in 2017. Yeah. Clemson's a really good team. There's no shame in that. I, I just told you what I think about Pitt. I think their defense may be the second best in the league, uh, in a league with pretty good defenses. So if And Pitt, as a program, maybe not talent-wise, but as a program, is a couple of steps ahead of where Miami is. So while I think Miami certainly is capable of it, even if, even if it comes down to it and they make it to the championship game, as long as you play it close, nine wins I think is a good marker to really put a flag down. And then, uh, and, and I think if you win nine, you win a bowl, you can get to 10. That's, that's what Mario Cristobal needs to really keep this thing. Yeah. Um, last one, you can go. Um, give me a breakout star on offense and defense that, that uh, nobody knows about yet. Oh, or Will Smith. <laughs> uh, defensively, I'll say Jared verse at Florida state. I think he's gotten a lot of talk. Actually, you know what? No, I'm going to say Noah Taylor at North Carolina. I thought Noah Taylor in that game against Bethune Cook against uh, FAMU uh, really did some good things. He was played out of position. I thought at Virginia, he's been an excellent pass rusher his entire career. And if he stays healthy, I think Noah Taylor has a potential to upset the apple cart in terms of like all ACC defensive ends. Cause I could pretty much tell you five are going to be, if you can jump into that group, then you've done something. So I think one of those two guys is going to be certainly a breakout star offensively. Um, offensively, there's so many guys coming back. I think it's tough. I'll, I'll say Porter Rooks, the receiver from NC State. Okay. Um, you know, he's a guy that's going to kind of operate in the slot. And with Emeka Mezzi, uh, there just wasn't – there weren't a lot of balls to go around. They're going to need a, a deep ball threat. They're going to need a big play threat on the perimeter. I don't know if Devin Carter is going to be that consistently. Thayer Thomas is a really good underneath player but they're going to need some explosive plays down the field. So I'll go Porter Rooks at NC State as sort of a breakout star for them at receiver. And who wins uh, player of the year? Uh, I'm going to go Tyler Van Dyke. Uh And that's not pandering to the home crowd. I'm going to go Tyler Van Dyke. I think it comes down at the end of the year to Tyler Van Dyke and Will Shipley. Um, Now, that it depends on how they divvy up carries at Clemson. Uh, I don't think there's a clear – person in the league Devin Leary won at preseason I told you my concerns about NC State on offense um I don't really have those for Miami and I th- I think they'll be a nine or ten win team which is enough wins to win player of the year so I'm gonna go TVD wow that's uh good news for Miami they have they've yeah. never had a offensive or defensive player of the year in the ACC is that true they've only had rookie of the year they've wow. never had that's crazy conference yeah but you know they've also never won the conference either so it's yeah, one of those deals where they've been here a while and haven't done much yeah, that's true. That's true. This is this is our year. This is the year. <laughs> Roddy, you're uh, you're always great. Love having you on the show, man. And I want people to make sure that uh, they're they're following your work. I know you're not doing the ACC podcast this year, right? You're 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 doing the show on Sirius, and yep. So I'm doing the show on Sirius. Uh, I'm usually on Mondays, ACC Today on Channel 371. We Chris Patola is on every day, and he has a rotating cast. I do the Monday show. We rip, whip around the league, talk about all the games. And honestly, we go off topic a lot. So if you like going off topic, you like, you know, talking to ball, uh, it often becomes an F1 podcast at times too. I know your Miami people got a, got a little taste of F1 last year. Yes. Um, it's a big F1 group there. So, you know, we have a lot of fun. I'm also doing uh, uh, the in play Wednesdays in play on ACC network at three o'clock Dallin Cuff and I, we kind of talk about all the mid week topics and stuff like that. So um, yeah. And then, and then obviously the weekend game. So, um, I'm, uh, I'm kind of all over the place. Uh, hopefully they, uh, they keep me doing, doing a lot of stuff. Yeah. Well, you'll be at Duke this week, Friday night for, uh, yep. for the game. So, uh, you'll get a chance to see Mike Elko and I think he's going to do a good job there. Uh, I think so too. And, and look, Duke's got some guys that are going to play in the NFL on that team. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, we were kind of talking, I was talking to a couple of writers before the season, David Hale and Andrea Adelson, we're going through, is Duke more talented than, and, and it comes down to like, who has more NFL players? Shaka Hayward's going to play in the NFL. 
Uh, RJ Oban and, and Dwayne Carter are going to play in the NFL. Parker Graham, a left tackle, probably going to play in the NFL. And then I think some of those secondary guys have a chance to make it. And it's not something that's foreign to Duke. So he's got talent. They're, they're missing some depth. We'll see what he does. But I think he's going to build it the right way. He was with Dave Clawson at Wake Forest. He was with Dave Clawson at Richmond. He's with Dave Clawson at Bowling Green, I believe, too. So he is a guy that, that knows how to build. All right. Roddy, we got to have you back on at some point during the season, brother. But thank you so much. Of course, man. Appreciate you having me, man.